and for tuning in. Um, I'm just going to give it a moment or two for some people to continue to arrive and then we will kick off. Um, I'm Annie, I'm our Campaigns and Communications Manager at World Jewish Relief, joined by our Chief Executive Paul Anticoni, um, our Head of Impact and Livelihoods, Ekaterina Mitiev, and uh, Maurice Halfgott, who is our Chair of Trustees, and they are joining us live from Kiev, where they are this evening. Um, they've been there since the weekend, meeting <laughs> our local partner organisations, visiting people who are being impacted by the war in Ukraine. Um, almost one year on and visiting our life-saving and life-changing projects there. So in a moment, I'm going to pass over to them to hear about the situation on the ground in Ukraine, our emergency response, which has reached a staggering 180,000 people and will continue to reach many more with your support, um, and to look at what the future might hold for Ukraine um, and how we'll continue to be there in the coming months and years. So we'll be here for about 30 minutes and you can put questions in the chat box in the Q&A function at the bottom of your screen uh, throughout and we'll try and take some of your questions at the end. Um, so please bear with us if we have any issues with connectivity. I'm sure you've heard that um, the internet isn't the most stable at the moment in Ukraine, but we'll, we'll do our best. Um, so I'm gonna come to Morris first. Um, this is your first time visiting Ukraine, I believe since the conflict began. Um, what are your first impressions and um, how does it feel to be here, you know, after reading so much about the conflict in the country over the past year? Well, thank you, Annie, and thank you all for joining us this evening. Uh, give you a context of where we are. We are um, in a warehouse that is funded and operated by one of our close partners who is um, running humanitarian relief operations from uh, here. Um, it's dark, uh, we've got a spotlight on, and if you can hear the generator in the background, because as you may know, Kiev is, um, as a result of the infrastructure missiles that are being indiscriminately sent by the Russians, uh, Kiev has intermittent power. Um, it's cold because it's cold here in, in Kiev at the moment, fortunately not as cold as it usually is, but cold. Uh, and and it, all that being said, it feels very positive to be here for a number of reasons. The, the first is because one sees signs all around of uh, Ukrainian resilience, resistance, resolve, optimism, and determination. There's a sign, a big sign as I walk along the street, um, be brave like Ukraine. And one can't help being inspired by the bravery and courage of the U Ukrainian people in re resistance. It secondly feels positive to be here because um, we and many, many others are making a difference in both humanitarian assistance, which is critically needed, and also longer term livelihood development, helping people to get back on their feet and get them a job. Nonetheless, it is still a little scary we took a 17-hour journey on the train from Ch uh, Chisnau in Moldova all the way to Kiev. And while we were on the train, you will have heard about the massive bombardments, including the, the really terrible uh, hit on a building in uh, Dnipro. Uh, and people here get on with their lives. There have been no missile attacks in the hours that we've been actually in Kiev. Um, but um, there is a, a sense of edge. There is a, a fear of a potential further attempt uh, by Russia to uh, invade from the north, from Belarus. Um, and therefore, there is a combination of um, confidence, optimism, um, fear, uh, cruelty, uh, and determination. So a whole bunch of mixed emotions, which I'm trying to sort out in my mind. Thank you. And you've mentioned uh, attacks on energy infrastructure um, and missiles. Uh, other than that, and including that, um, can you paint a picture of day to day life in Kiev? What have you seen? You know, to what extent could life be described as normal and what does it look like? Well, in, in some ways, there is a sense of, of normality. There are people walking in the streets. There are cafes open. Uh, there are 
cars on the road. Uh, there are people going about their business uh, and, and getting on with life. Uh, and we went out into the region um, today. We went to uh, um, Urpin, we went to uh, Bucha, which are the places really not far at all from here that were so terribly uh, occupied, attacked, and which terrible murders were, took place by the, by the Russian army. And you see incredible destruction, buildings which are, are literally crushed, buildings which have fallen down, fire, uh, damage. But you also see the building next door where only the windows were s smashed out and the windows have been put in already and people are going back and living again, getting on with life. You see a lot of military personnel on the streets. You see tank traps on the streets. You see um, uh, it's snowy here. It's got that sort of white, flat, gray, cold light, which is um, not the most uh, appealing. Um, uh, but as I say, there is this also this sense of huge appreciation. Uh, Paul and I went for a walk this morning. We got up early. I wanted to walk to Maidan Square and we, we took a, a walk and suddenly some very beefy um, Ukrainian um, uh, army personnel with their machine guns came to stop us going in that particular direction, said, where are you from? And we said, we're from London, England. And he said, thank you very much for being here. So that's a bit of what it's like. Mm -hmm. Wow, it sounds like a real dichotomy of sort of destruction and tension, but also resilience and some sense of normality, which is a real testament, like you said, to the Ukrainian people and, and their resilience. Um, and I know you've met some of those people, in particular people who've been supported by World Jewish Relief in and around Kyiv. Um, is there a story or maybe a particular interaction from your time you'd like to share with us? Well, I, I, I feel there were, I've, I've, we've only actually been in Ukraine off the train. We were in Ukraine a long time, trapped on the train. <laughs> Ukraine off the train, um, I think it's 36 hours. Um, and in that time, we've already met many, many people. But the one who's sticking out in my mind at the moment is a gentleman called Vasily. Uh, he is uh, 92 years old. And he and his family were recognized by Yad Vashem as being righteous amongst the nations. That means that it was verified that his family um, took in and hid at great risk to their personal lives uh, Jewish people, in their case between 1942 and 1944, for two and a half years. They took them in and hid them in their farm, basically. Um, the Nazis didn't find out about them. Their neighbors didn't find out about that. Uh, and then he went on to be a colonel in the Red Army for 32 years. He, at the end of our visit, he took out his uh, <laughs> took out his medals. When I asked him what it was that he'd done uh, since he was a, a, a child, a young a young child, he, he showed me these medals. Um, and I was just very touched because he has great dignity. Um, he is living not in abject poverty, but uh, certainly in very, very limited means. Um, and through a program that uh, we supported for winter relief, um, we, he, he got additional blankets and support um, for him and for his wife, that that really, really made a difference to him. And I mean, there are only 42 righteous uh, Gentiles in the whole of Ukraine at the moment. Um, and apparently there are only two who are still able to talk and converse and tell their stories. And it was enormous privilege to, to meet him and to know that um, through our programs, we had done something for him that he valued and appreciated. Thank you very much for, for sharing that. And we'll come back to you, I'm sure, with questions. And a reminder to put questions in the Q&A box if you haven't already. Um, we'll be answering those later. Um, now to food. Um, I know it's not your first time in. But we can call up whoever wants. No, we'll go to Katarina. Um, okay. Good, Katarina. <laughs> yeah, we'll go to you next. You look, you're ready. So um, you've travelled many times. I believe you've been to Ukraine six times since the conflict began and you've been visiting and supporting our partners really sort of, you know, hands on, um, on the ground in that time. Um, so based on your experience, can you share a bit more about what World Jewish Relief is doing and in particular uh, our approach um, and what that's been since the invasion began? 
Thank you, and thank you very much, everyone, for joining us tonight. So absolutely, there has been enormous change in our response. So the first month, I think all of us would prefer not to remember at all because it was so frightening and upsetting and there was so much unknown. And at that time, we were just making immediate decisions about rescuing lives. That was the most important thing. And it was literally sometimes about using your own connections. And at that time, I used my phone probably more than I ever used it before, using your personal connections to identify, let's say, drivers who can evacuate people from particular dangerous locations, find people in maybe Western Ukraine who have access to like life-saving medicine and organizing how it can be transported to the east of the country. So it was just really ad hoc emergency response saving lives. And that is highly appreciated by our partners because we provided enormous flexibility. And unlike many agencies who had to take time to really understand what to do, we were really privileged and lucky, if we can say so, because we already had great partners because we have been working in Ukraine for many years. So I remember on 24th, the decision immediately was made to transfer some funds to the partners. You can hear the generator uh, to transfer funds to the partners to enable them to make this kind of um, immediate actions to save lives and then obviously our response have been evolving and also what we really understood really quickly that ukraine is an enormous country it's really big um and it's like population of 40 million and obviously the situation is very different and let's say while the eastern part is really now close to front line in the western part there are lots of internally displaced people with very different needs so we very quickly uh, realized that we need to keep economy going in a way and we need to contribute towards that and we also need to contribute towards restoring normality for those people who had to flee uh, their homes so um, we almost have not stopped our back to work, our livelihood activities, and we continued them throughout because actually, despite everything, there have been jobs and people have been, as Morris mentioned, amazingly resilient in the face of what's happening and try to start uh, kickstart their businesses and everything. So today, um, our partner here in Kiev just reported that the employment rate uh, for the past six months have been 58%, which is like really impressive. It's not as good as it was before the war, but it's still really, really good. So we kept um, obviously providing psychosocial support because people have been really traumatized so that has been very uh, important and also uh, our support for all the people continued because they have been also in real need of um, assistance and for many older people it had been like extremely tough because what we need to remember that before both russia and ukraine used to be part of soviet union so many people in ukraine they either have relatives in Russia, they probably studied there, maybe they're from there. So for them, there is this deep, deep sense of betrayal. They just cannot believe what is really happening and how Russians can do that to Ukrainians. So they also need not only material assistance, but also psychological support to come in terms to this kind of enormous tragedy and uh, what has been done to them, this enormous betrayal. And also we have been working more and more with quite a new group for us, which is children because Ukrainian children have been really affected first by years of pandemic where the schools have been closed and they had to study online and we know it has not been great in UK and it has been even more difficult in Ukraine but also they have been really traumatized during this time so we can't even imagine what young children had to experience and go through so now we have more and more we're developing these children activities and if at the beginning we focused on respite now we're focusing more and more on their academic achievements as well and also supporting them with building their social skills. So we continue some um, humanitarian activities still where they're absolutely needed, especially in the east of the country, recently liberated areas such as Kherson, but more and more we're investing in the, let's say, sustainability recovery efforts. Mm -hmm. And can you expand a bit more on jobs? I think people, when they think of a war zone, maybe don't think of jobs as a priority. Why is it so important for people to be in work? Yeah, as I'm always saying, because I'm in charge of our livelihoods, uh, livelihoods projects, and I'm I'm really passionate about what I'm doing and passionate about my work, and I think this is the most important thing, and everybody should really work and enjoy their jobs as much as I do. So jobs is much more than just money, because money can be given, you know, assistance can be provided, but jobs is really about dignity, it's about uh, you know, it's about self belief, it's about the sense of control of your environment, it's about believing that you actually need 
need it and somebody is prepared, you know, to employ you and pay for your services. It's also a step towards normalization, you know, like lives of these people have been turned upside down. They moved often to a different location. They often lost all their social connections. Their house might have been destroyed. So the job is an essential step to actually return to that normality and return this kind of sense of self to them. So it's absolutely essential to, um, to provide this assistance. Mm-hmm. And um, one more question for you. I'd love to know a bit more about um, what makes our approach unique. And I think that one thing that we've touched upon a lot is um, our work with partners and our partnership approach and sort of the depth of that. So could you tell us a bit more about, in particular, in these months, you know, how you've worked with partners? Unique approach is all about relationships. You know, I think World Jewish Relief is all about relationships. It's not about numbers, it's not about like massive scale, but it's really about building relationships. And this is also with our supporters who are joining us tonight, but this is also with our partners and it's also with, with our participants. Like we know people we support. We know this 180,000 people, we actually know their stories, which is absolutely amazing. And we go kind of deep and we build this relationship and we really, it's not about just giving people like a box of assistance. It's really finding out what it is exactly they need and how we can empower and support them. And of course, our partners are absolutely fundamental to everything we do because it doesn't matter how good we are. They are on the front line, actually now kind of almost literally on the front line doing the work. So I think my job all these months has been about ensuring that they're okay. So their well-being has been my highest priority from the day one. And I have been enormously worried how they're going to cope and if they're going to withstand all the stress and ongoing pressure and all these unknown issues and worrying about their children, their pets and their elderly and everything. And I have have to say our partners have been absolute heroes uh, in the face of this enormous personal challenges they just found the strength to continue supporting those who are more and more in need so i think they have done absolutely astonishing job and they also really appreciate uh, the support we have been providing and generosity of um, our community which has been again exceptional in doing what we were enabling them to do and our flexibility in our ongoing care so we have been receiving lots of thanks uh, during this visit and expression of gratitude thank you very much i think um we can all agree that you know what our partners do every day really is pretty inspiring and um... if i can if i can just add a point about partners because we're, we're here with them now we're in a warehouse that world jewish relief has paid to rent we've been driving around in vehicles that world jewish relief has bought and we're with our partner who's wearing World Jewish Relief t-shirt, <laughs> flap jacket, <laughs> and badge, and is very proud to be World Jewish Relief. But they could not do it without our resources and our expertise. We could not do it without their on-the-ground relationships, understanding, and delivery. It's, partners can sound like a very anodyne theoretical term. It's, it's a very, very powerful model for us to succeed in delivering. Mm-hmm. Thank you, for sure. I think that's something that has been very clear that our the strength of our partners has really been what's enabled us to be flexible and be reactive and extremely you know, fast and effective since the beginning, as, as you mentioned, Ekaterina. Um, I'm gonna move on to Paul now. I'm gonna ask you probably the hardest question of all because no one knows the answer, but if you were to look into your, your crystal ball, you know, where almost a year into this really horrific conflict, which has sort of taken on proportions that none of us would have ever have imagined, you know, this time a year ago. Um, if you were to look into your crystal ball and tell us, you know, what you think the next months or the next year might hold for Ukraine and for Ukrainians, I mean, what what would you you think at this point? I mean, I think the only, I mean, first of all, good evening, everybody. Uh, uh, it's bloody cold here, my hands are freezing but I'm enjoying it and I'm enjoying particularly the 186 participants. What a fantastic celebration of members of our community caring about Ukraine and how we're responding to the crisis. So an enormous thank you. That's very inspiring. Um, I think the only certainty over the next three, six, 12 months is uncertainty. Um, We probably thought in October, 2022, things couldn't get any worse. And then Putin decided to start targeting Uh, not just civilian infrastructure, which he'd been targeting right from the start, but the energy infrastructure. And that's brought, you know, the country into darkness. 
uh, and when it's cold uh, and there's no heating and there's no light and there are no street lights and there are no traffic lights uh, and people are wandering around with little torches. If you're old and infirm, life is miserable. Um, and, and I think, you know, uh, uh, there were so many different opinions as to what might happen. But there is, you know, even if conflict stopped tomorrow and it's not going to, the needs, the humanitarian needs and the recovery needs are immense. I mean, I think we all can read from the news the uh, 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 forces dug in in the east and the southeast, this uh, 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 growing uh, uh, alleged threat of, of troops again amassing on the Belarusian border. Um, uh, so much depends on Putin's intentions and so much depends on military and cash support from, from Ukraine's allies. Um, there was uh, uh, un uh, undoubtedly over the last couple of days celebration amongst those we've met about the British government's decision to uh, provide a dozen Challenger tanks. I don't know if that's a game changer militarily or not because I couldn't recognize one tank from another. But the, the, uh, the solidarity of military support gives an added boost and confidence. And, you know, commentators here would say, if the British are showing leadership on that, others may come in as well, and that can further tilt the balance in Ukraine's military favor. Um, but the war is not good for anyone here, and, and it is definitely eroding uh, um, people's um, uh, strengths and, and capacity to cope. Um, I mean, we have not met, I don't think, one family who hasn't been torn apart from other parts of the family, either physically or emotionally or even politically. We met a, uh, uh, we met a twin, a, a, an elderly gentleman whose twin brother was in Simferopol in Crimea. Uh, um, they, they, they split uh, geographically many years apart. But of course, one is now living in Crimea under, under Russian uh, annexation, and the other is a, a, a Ukrainian supporter in Kiev. <laughs> And the two twins, born minutes apart, can't speak to each other. Now, the deep trauma, I mean, mothers and daughters split. Another mother and daughter we, we met today, uh, uh, her daughter had to move out because the school she was going to uh, closed down. So she's had to go to a school further away. She's only living, I don't know, 10 kilometers, sure, 30 kilometers away from her mother. But her mother hasn't seen her 14-year-old daughter for eight weeks or 10 weeks because there's just no transport so you know we talk about you know lives ruined and families ruined uh, the deep trauma is is immense um so i you know all signs are that this conflict is going to evolve and deepen uh victories here and victories there the winter makes it much harder and it is it's bitterly cold to 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 be outside with a gun in your hand i can imagine um and much depends of course on the commitments of the West, not just militarily and cash-wise, but also to maintain a level of uh, investment and support to enable Ukrainians to, 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 to cope with this, this status quo of its, you know, 42 million Ukrainians, uh, the Russian invasion, 14 million have been displaced in some way or another, seven million, I think, of the Boston international border, but that's still, you know, 34 million Ukrainians here trying to cope on an economy that has absolutely tanked, uh, massive job losses, hundreds of thousands of businesses closed. Schools can only operate if you've got a bomb shelter. And this country did not build itself on bomb shelters. You know, there just aren't bomb shelters. Sirens go off and everybody says you should run for the bomb shelter. There aren't any other than the metro stations. So um, much, uh, 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 much can still change probably for the worse which is why we need to hope for the best, uh, prepare for the worst probably, but a very changing situation. Mm -hmm. So you, you paint a picture of immense uncertainty and, and in that, that landscape, how do we plan? You know, what, what a World Jewish Relief, you know, what are we planning as an organization or expecting to need to do to respond over the next few months? And I mean, what are those conversations like in, you know, in this current climate? I mean, there were some, there were some guarantees, you know, uh, uh, for many, many years, we've been supporting an elderly Jewish client group that we have not stopped supporting 
over the last 11 months. And our program of home care, winter support, medical support, social support is absolutely fundamental to what we're doing. Uh, and while you know some parts of the Jewish community have rightly left, and we would have encouraged or helped them to leave or evacuated them, for many of the older members of, of, of our community, they can't leave. Uh, um, for mobility problems or because they don't want to leave their house or because they don't want to leave their son who's fighting on the front line, or they don't want to leave their, their dogs and cats. Uh, Ukrainians are absolutely pet mad. Uh, I mean, it is, it is remarkable. Uh, um, so uh, we will continue to do that. Um, we want to continue to provide humanitarian support to areas of high humanitarian need, but low humanitarian access, so the hard to reach areas where others cannot. And that's because um, we have unparalleled access through some of these partnerships better than any other agencies. I haven't, I mean, in the 36 hours, I haven't seen another agency uh, uh, out and about. Um, but thirdly, you know, Katerina reminds us and our partners remind us that uh, we've got to be careful about creating a dependency on handouts. Um, Ukraine will not be helped if it's just given everything. A mm -hmm. And, and the, the, you know, the greatest thing about Ukraine is its people. This is the most remarkable group of individuals. That's the staff, our team members here, our Ukrainians, absolutely incredible people. Um, and so helping them recover their jobs and their assets and their livelihoods so that they earn money, even in midst this conflict. And we, you know, we met with, um, I think, one of the most famous members of Britain's Jewish community in Ukraine at the moment, which is the British ambassador to Ukraine, Dame Melinda Simmons. Uh, um, and, uh, you know, clearly a convergence of uh, recovery agendas that jobs are best, um, but without um, neglecting uh, mm -hmm. uh, immediate needs. And finally, um, I think, you know, I, I was probably less understanding, even though, you know, I celebrate the Ukrainians working in the World Jewish Relief Office in London and I see their trauma, I think I've... I've really felt very personally the immense mental health stresses and strains. Uh, it's called, you know, post-traumatic stress disorder. It's got a clinical term, but people cry in front of you, male and female. Their emotions are simmering. They've lost so much. Um, and we have to find a way through both our physical provision of support um, to provide some means of, of, of giving people a way to help their own psychological well-being, because uh, the trauma is so deep um, and it will be a critical part of, of Ukraine's recovery. Mm -hmm. Thank you. And I think one of the main questions that we're, we're being asked and that people want to know is how they can help. And, you know, so many people who are here have already been a part of this and we're so thankful to everyone who has supported our response. Um, what can people do today or in the coming weeks and months if they want to support, help us to support our partners to respond? Well, we've been spending uh, the last 36 hours really talking to partners about what the needs are. Um, and if I look at the next 12 months ahead, I mean, I'm daunted by the scale of need and, and our resource requirements. Um, and, and as a result, we've decided that to coincide with the 12 month anniversary of the Russian invasion of Ukraine, World Jewish Relief will relaunch its Ukraine crisis appeal. We're going to have to raise millions to be able to cope with even short and medium term needs. And I would love to be able to call on our most fabulous supporters. It'll be one of those online campaigns where it's so easy to ask and network all your friends on text or email or WhatsApp. Please mobilize support and ask your own friends to help World Jewish Relief's Ukraine crisis appeal. It'll be relaunching to the day that Russia, Russian tanks crossed into Ukraine, the 24th to the 27th of February, um, so only in uh, just over a month's time. And I'd love to count on everybody for their support. Thank you.
Thank you very much. So the link to get involved in that campaign is in the chat now. So you can have a look and click on that. Um, I would ask if people can stay with us for five more minutes. I'm going to take a couple of questions. Um, we're slightly overrunning because we've had so much, so much to share. Um, and thank you very much for those contributions. I'm going to take a few questions in one. So um, this might be best for Ekaterina, but any of you feel free. So we've been asked whether supermarkets and food shops are well stocked um, and also whether Jewish old age homes and schools, you know, exist. And if so, are they functioning at the moment? So maybe you can answer that. Yeah, absolutely. So supermarkets, it's again, it's very much depends where you are in the country. So if you are, let's say, in Kiev, uh, the supermarkets are very well stocked, but there is a massive inflation. So prices has increased by 20% just in the recent months, so 20, 25%. So there is, you can buy whatever you need, but it's really expensive. So just to give you an example, yesterday we had lunch in the restaurant. There was five of us. We spent a pension of uh, a woman we visited just before that lunch. So we spent her monthly pension on that, on the food only. It was so, a modest lunch. Maybe. And it was a modest lunch. We only had some kind of starters and soups. We didn't even have a main dish. So it just shows you that the prices are just enormous. And especially for pensioners, it's really difficult. But again, at least pensioners are guaranteed some income, while maybe some people who lost their jobs are not getting any income at all. So, but if you go in further east, obviously there are no supermarkets, especially like close to the front line and in the smaller localities, like smaller villages and towns. So that's where we try to deliver this essential humanitarian aid. So, and then the second question. So in terms of Jewish schools, again, everything very much depends on their location. So, for example, in places like Lviv and Khmelnytsky, schools do operate, but in places further east, like in Kharkiv, for example, where we have our Jewish partners, like Siem Shalavim, they can't open. So everything is online. In Odessa, majority is online. So, yeah, it very much depends on locations. In some places, uh, those kind of institutions are open in some nothing is kind of happening, but there are some online activities and our partners with our support provide them, especially for all the people. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Um, we have also been asked about our partners. Who are they? Are they professionals? Are they volunteers? And how do we recruit and organize them? How do we find our partners? Yeah, so as I have said, uh, we have been with our partners for many, many years. So uh, we have partners from obviously our Jewish partners, mainly Hassets. They have been established around, I think, by uh, JDC. They have been around for 20 years. And then we also have our livelihood development partners. Some of them have been established by us. And then we nurtured them to becoming like extremely successful uh, organization, also ra raising funds from other donors. And then um, I'm just trying to think if we had any new partners. Then our LDP partners launched a humanitarian partner. So we met yesterday our newest partner from Kharkiv. Uh, so he's very new to the whole humanitarian sphere. He used to be a very successful IT businessman. But because our director of our <laughs> long-term LDP partner, he's her, uh, she has known him for a long time professionally, and he has been exceptional. And he's doing an amazing job just reaching really difficult places because he has some useful connections with the military and he's getting this information. So yeah, so these are all long-term independent uh, NGOs in Ukraine. And uh, we have nurtured and built these relationships. And some of us are just really like family. And as Morris has said, it's very mutually beneficial relationship. They rely on us, we rely on them. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much. I'm aware of the time, so we're gonna leave it there. I'm sorry, we've got a few questions we haven't come to, but you can be in contact. Um, we welcome, you know, via our website, um, any questions and, and please do get in touch and, and get involved with that campaign. Um, thank you very much for joining us this evening. I'm just going to hand back over to Morris um, for some final words. Well, I'm, I'm, uh, I'm conscious I'm keeping many of you from your dinner at home. And um, also we're having to do this on Starlink uh, in, order, in, in order that we could have a reliable internet connection. And I'm not sure how it pays, but presumably the longer we're on here, the more money we funnel to Elon Musk. <laughs> so, so whether you think that's a good, I think good idea that we should extend the extend extend the broadcast or not. Um, it's it's a true privilege to be here with professionals like Paul and Katerina, as well as our partners. And I say that as someone who, on behalf of all the supporters of the charity and the organization knows how good 
and how much we rely on our professional team, but but has come out on all our behalves to see it for myself or to see it for all of us. And I can tell you that it, it is what it says on the tin. The, the professional team, our partners, the work that you as supporters enable is making a profound and important difference. And I want to take the opportunity to thank them, but also all of you for that support. We're not making an appeal today. You know, it is always possible to contact us, to go on the website and to donate large or small to the projects and programs of World Jewish Relief. But we're not making an appeal today, except this. Please, please take the link. We'll send it by email as well. And when that anniversary campaign comes, don't just give yourselves, as I know, I'm pretty sure almost every one of you who turned up to this will want to give yourself. But don't just give yourself. Reach out to 10, 20, 30 other people and get them to give. Because every donation, not just in scale of money counts, but participation counts as well. And we would really, really appreciate that. And, and, and we all want to make a difference. And a way we can all make a difference is getting others who are not necessarily giving to give to. So please do consider that. Have a good evening. Thank you very much. If you can see, you can't really see, but when we do this, we've got the, the steam coming up. So we're, we're going to go to somewhere else that doesn't have Starlink, but hopefully is a little bit warmer. And wish you a good night. Good night, everybody. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Bye.